Tonight, tactical officers flood a North York business complex after two people are shot during a robbery. The police had already showed up and they were breaking down the window into this building here. Police say the moving company where it happened was targeted. They're still looking for suspects tonight. Plus, victim impact statements are read at the sentencing hearing for three former students of St. Michael's College School. All three teens could be facing jail time. And got the snow, which made it extra special. There's not really anything not to like about it. The Toronto Christmas market is back, but it'll cost you more to see on the weekends. Good evening, I'm Mike Wise. Toronto police are still looking for two suspects who they say shot two people at a business in North York this morning. The emergency task force quickly set up in the mostly industrial and business area near Dufferin and Steeles. But as Lauren Pelly tells us, the two gunmen were able to get away. The police had already showed up and they were breaking down the window into this building here. After they broke down the window, they came in and they came out with two of my colleagues. This worker at a quiet commercial complex in North York says the area became a massive crime scene. They weren't injured by a gunshot. They were shaken up and disturbed and um, minor injuries from diving out of the way of the shooter. Police say a pair of suspects entered the offices of this moving company, made some kind of demands, then opened fire. A man and woman were shot and taken to hospital, while a third person suffered an anxiety attack after watching the shooting unfold. Two men came into the building with wearing masks, and one went one way, one went another. We came out, and there was a bunch of fire departments and police, ETF, and canine units came, kind of descended on the place. The brief chaos unfolded around 10.30 this morning on Magnetic Drive near Dufferin and Steeles. Heavily armed officers remained on scene throughout the day, an unusually heavy police presence sparked by early reports of an active shooter. But Chief Mark Saunders says the suspects likely fled on foot. We don't fully understand what this case is about at this point in time. While the motive isn't yet clear, police believe it was a targeted robbery. One employee did tell us the moving company sometimes keeps a fair amount of cash on hand to pay temp workers. It is a solvable case in the sense that we've been able to respond immediately, lots of resources, lots of cooperation, and uh, it's, it's very solvable. Toronto police were on scene throughout the day and even now in the evening you can see the forensic vehicle behind me. They've been asking people for any dash cam footage, any surveillance video in hopes of finding these two suspects. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Three former St. Mike students could be looking at jail time for their role in two sexual assaults at St. Michael's College School last year. At a sentencing hearing today, the Crown is suggesting the boys serve between 10 to 15 months. The incidents took place last year. Three boys on the school's football team ripped the pants off of a teammate in the locker room, then sexually assaulted him with a broom handle. A few weeks later, with another student, there was another similar case of sexual assault with a broom handle. This one captured and shared on social media. At the sentencing hearing today, the parents of that boy provided a victim impact statement saying, it is one thing to be violently assaulted, penetrated, and humiliated and helpless to protect yourself from that violence, but it is a whole other thing to know that it is being recorded so that other people can see your humiliation and the thing that happened to you after it's over, so it's never really over. Now, lawyers for the three boys argued today they should, have, uh, they should not have to serve time in custody, saying they are remorseful and ashamed. The judge will decide December 19th. Well, in less than two weeks, elementary teachers across the province will begin a work to rule campaign. The union representing thousands of teachers says the way negotiations are going with the province, it had no choice. Lorenda Redekop tells us what it'll mean for schools. The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario says come November 26th, its members will work to rule. This is not about affecting students. It will have no effect on students' learning conditions or their safety in any way. The union has 83,000 members. It says an overwhelming 98% voted in favour of job action. ETFO has come up with a long list of what teachers won't do in what it calls phase one of work to rule. It says all the items are administrative duties. Included in that list, they will not complete report cards, though teachers will provide a list of marks. Participate in EQAO-related activities, the standardized tests. Participate in any school board or Ministry of Education professional learning outside the school day. The union had this message to the Education Minister. 
come to our table, make a commitment to full day kindergarten, come to our table and reinvest that $90 million for students with special needs and who are at risk. That will start this process, that will kickstart this process and we can move forward. But Minister Stephen Lecce says this is about money. They want 2% uh, in compensation and benefits and salary that across the system is $1.5 billion. We just don't think that that is a priority of families. He compared this to the 1% a year wage increase educational support staff with CUPE agreed to. And he argues kids will be affected by the job action. Not providing report cards uh, and, quarter, and, and updated assessments, performance assessments of the status of your child doesn't hurt anyone but children in Ontario. Parents we talked to back the teachers. Unfortunate action that didn't need to take, but they have to take it, so I support the teachers. I think the teachers need to be um, recognized. They do hard work. Ontario's secondary school teachers are also without a contract and close to being in a legal strike position. Their union president tells me they'll be holding a news conference tomorrow to discuss next steps. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Kyle Kennedy's here with her first look at the forecast. I like the warmer temperatures. I don't know about the gloomy gray day, though. <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, we can't seem to put all the positive things together in one package for our weather, right? But hey, at least it felt good to get our temperatures a little warmer, nowhere near where they should be at this time of year when we should be seeing highs closer to just over seven degrees. But have a look at this. It's pleasant to not see a negative in front of every single number up there for our daytime highs, even if it's just barely there at zero for us and a look at what's happening you know we'll have a little bit of cloud cover and I just want you to take note that through the day tomorrow especially for communities kind of to the north and to the northwest of the GTA there'll be some flurry activity but some of this may work its way down especially into tomorrow afternoon and be a little bit and I mean very very light but just a little bit of a light mix. So if you flurry is kind of mixing with a little bit of shower activity, but that's a sign because our temperature is going to be a little milder. After that though, another punch of cold air moves in, but it'll be somewhat short-lived. Overnight tonight, minus three. There you go, a milder high tomorrow of two degrees. That short-lived colder air and then the gentle warm-up all to come a little later in the show. Okay, thanks, Scott. You're welcome. A new homeless shelter is getting ready to open its doors near Runnymede in St. Clair West. It comes at a time when the city says the demand for emergency shelter is unprecedented. The new building is called Junction Place. It's a men's only shelter with 50 beds. It's also fully accessible and pet friendly and includes counseling, medical and mental health care, as well as services like showers and laundry. And when the shelter was proposed, there were some concerns about its location. The shelter's manager says homelessness isn't just a downtown issue. We're looking at spreading shelters out across the city. Um, people don't become homeless in the downtown area. They have to move downtown to receive services. The city says the demand for emergency shelter has never been greater than right now, with most facilities across the city operating at near capacity. Well, hundreds of Torontonians packed into the Eaton Centre tonight, eager to witness the official start of the holiday season, the lighting of the mall's iconic Christmas tree. Three, two, one! Woo! Yeah! That is spectacular. Now on hand for the tree lighting, a few people you may recognize, tennis star Bianca Andrescu and the big man himself, Santa Claus. Drawing a huge crowd, of course. Another sure sign it's Christmas in Toronto. The Christmas market in the distillery district is officially open. We sent our Angelina King to check it out opening night. The countdown is on, but the magic of Christmas already in the air. It looks really creative. And there's like lights, different colors. There's not really anything not to like about it. A busy night on the first day of the 10th annual Toronto Christmas Market, the city's own take on European Christmas markets that date back to the early 1400s, complete with Santa Claus is coming to town. 500 performers, 30 vendors, 20 that are just food, plus that iconic 50-foot tree decorated with 40,000 lights and ornaments, and one Santa. 
So what's your favorite part about the Christmas market? I love the Christmas this. Christmas tree? Yeah, the Christmas, Christmas tree is beautiful. amazing. It's amazing, yeah. Probably the food here, there's a lot of choices to eat and a lot of things that we've never tried before, like the s'mores. We usually come every year with the boys here, especially loves to come in the first day. There are so many wonderful booths, Christmas items from all over the world. Like these mitts, perhaps? Yes, these are very special. No, 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 no. <laughs> but then there are the crowds. Last year, 650,000 people came through. The market is expecting 10% less this year on purpose. We're trying to get the most Christmas feeling and the best Christmas spirit. And the way to do that isn't more, it's more quality. The admission price is going up by $2 during peak times. It's free on the weekdays, but weekends are now $12 at the door or $8 in advance. Or instead of that $8 ticket, the market is offering free admission on the first two weekends only to anybody who brings in eight cans of food for the Daily Bread Food Bank. And you can come and take in all this holiday spirit until December 22nd. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. We were somehow from Wilson Station to Westwood Loop, which is in like deep Mississauga. These Toronto Presto users are sounding the alarm after being charged at locations nowhere near where they were traveling. We'll have that story coming up. A man was rushed to hospital with critical injuries after a stabbing in Parkdale tonight. Police were called to Queen and Roncesvalles Vales just before 10 o'clock. They say the suspect fled the scene. There's no description of that suspect that's been released yet. Well, if you have a Presto card, have you ever taken the time to check the charges on it online? Well, do you know you even could? Well, we're hearing from two riders tonight who are wondering why they were erroneously charged for fare in a different city. Metrolink says it could be a GPS tracking issue, but as Farah Morali tells us, it's unclear how often this is actually happening. I tapped at Wilson Station. There. Traveling more than 20 kilometers is unthinkable to do in six minutes on GTA roads. So we take the bus from uh, here, just around the corner. But according to Samson Solomon and Ashley Howard's Presto records, that's exactly what they did on transit. We were somehow from Wilson Station to Westwood Loop, which is in like deep Mississauga. Their transaction records show they tapped at Wilson Station just after 8 p.m. on their way home back in August. But minutes later, we're on a bus on Mississauga's My Way Transit. It's next to impossible to be at Wilson Station and then like six minutes later be somewhere like north of the airport. Yeah. When they called Presto to complain, they were told they need to investigate further. I'm here at Wilson Station. This is where Ashley and Samson tapped their cards at 8.06 p.m. that day. Now, according to Presto, their cards were tapped again six minutes later at the Westwood Mall bus loop. We're going to see how long it takes to actually get there. 
We drove straight there, taking the fastest route on the 401. We didn't make any stops along the way and didn't hit any major traffic. So we just got to the Westwood Mall bus loop from Wilson Station. Time check is 23 minutes, 11 seconds. The weather isn't so great, but even if you shave off five, 10 minutes, six minutes is a bit of a stretch. After CBC Toronto contacted Metrolinx, Howard and Solomon's charges were reversed, but it insists this is unusual. I've been here at Metrolinx a long time, and that isn't a complaint I hear uh, very often or ever. The problem could be related to the GPS embedded on the card readers. In a moving vehicle, like uh, the old streetcars, for example, or the new streetcars or buses, it can be a challenge because it's a moving vehicle. There are always going to be rogue GPS readings on vehicles. This transit advocate says GPS errors have been happening for a while, but as Metrolinx pushes to integrate Presto with other transit systems, it could get more problematic. It's going to be very important that people get charged correctly for where they tap to use their card. Uh, if, if you've got jurisdictional issues where a York Region rider gets charged for being in Toronto or vice versa, uh, this could proliferate. Though Metrolink says they aren't seeing more complaints like this, Solomon and Howard have this advice to Presto um, users. Be careful, uh, double check everything. Farah Morelli, CBC News, Toronto. I'm really grateful and blessed for this opportunity, uh, but I understand what I'm coming into. I've been quoted as comparing Sonny to LeBron James. One of the biggest names in rugby is coming to play for Toronto. I'll have all the details on Sonny Bill Williams coming right up. The weather update is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. A rugby superstar is bringing his talents to our city. Sonny Bill Williams is joining the Toronto Wolfpack. And while Williams is not well known outside his sport, his goal is to make rugby more visible in North America. Lisa Shing has more. If you're anything of a rugby fan, you'll know the name Sonny Bill Williams. A force on the field in different leagues and types of rugby and in the boxing ring. And today in the UK, the official announcement he's coming to play for the Toronto Wolfpack, a team that recently got promoted to the top tier Super League. I'm really grateful and blessed for this opportunity. 
what better, I guess, pressure environment would you want to test yourself? That pressure environment he's talking about is because Toronto is already jam-packed with pro sports. Not only do we have the NBA champion Raptors, the Leafs and Blue Jays, there's Toronto FC and the Argonauts too. And rugby isn't as well known around here. For Williams, that's part of the appeal. How amazing would it be if, if, if rugby league kicks off and in uh, North America. Since 2017, the Toronto Wolfpack has been steadily making inroads, hoping to draw people in with a sport that's long been the craze of nations like England, Australia, and New Zealand, where Williams played with the legendary All Blacks, with whom he's won two World Cups. If we can succeed, it's going to open up avenues for, for young Polynesian boys, young uh, English lads that could provide for themselves and their family in, a, in another country. The Wolfpack's head coach is hoping to make use of Williams' star power. So what Toronto are doing is making people around the world take note of Super League. Those stands behind us were totally full. This sports reporter has been following the rise of the Toronto Wolfpack since its inception two years ago and says interest in the sport is rapidly growing in the city and adding Williams to the roster will elevate Toronto's name internationally. You get that name, people are going to suddenly want to tune in at whatever time it is in their own countries to see Sonny Bill Williams play. Williams will start the season with the Wolfpack in England early next year before coming to play on this field in April when it's warmer. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. Colette is back with her extended forecast. I'm stuck on two words you said, gentle warm-up. Please tell me more. <laughs> yeah, gentle warm-up. You know, I'd be okay with just a sharp warm-up. That'd be just fine. But no, what we're going to have is gentle, meaning it's going to kind of take its time. And we've got a little bit of cold air to get through before we start to see that gentle warm-up. Our average high at this time of year, I know we aren't seeing it, but it is around 7 degrees and our low right around the freezing mark. That's kind of typical if you take you know, 30 year averages as we do when we look at the climate summaries, but it's just not where we're at at the moment, right? As we head into tomorrow, I do want you to know we could have some intermittent flurries uh, and into the later afternoon, maybe even a little bit of light mix, but it'll be scattered in nature and very light in nature as well. And then this works its way through. And what comes in Friday night into Saturday is that cold air that is going to move back in kind of for a night and day and then it's going to start to retreat on us. But what comes with it, which will be most welcome, is going to be some sunshine. So as that ridge builds in, we'll see sunshine as we go into the weekend. Now in terms of the temperatures just overnight tonight, they're not that bad, not that extreme. Just looking at minus three with quite a bit of cloud cover for you into southwestern Ontario, high around two degrees in Windsor. Now the winds southwest to begin the day, but they will be shifting to towards the northwest and be a little bit gusty at times. So it's actually going to feel a little bit cooler to get into those afternoon hours, irregardless of the temperature. And then overnight tonight through the GTA, Markham, you're going down to minus four, St. Catharines and other communities. Looks like about minus three for our overnight temperature. And then there we go into tomorrow afternoon. Light precipitation, scattered but could be a little bit of a mix. There's a chance for some flurries in the morning hours, but into the afternoon and later afternoon is when we might get that little shot coming through. But highs of two to three degrees, which it may not be seasonal, but we'll all be happy, I would expect, to welcome in those temperatures. Now, here's that shot of cold air. Take note of it, because it does mean Saturday morning is going to be cold to start. Minus 10 is that low. Minus three Saturday afternoon, but with the sunshine, and then as we go into Sunday, we'll start to lose the coldest of that air. Temperatures getting a bit above freezing as we go into next week. Looks like a pretty good day for the Santa Claus parade. But I will say it is such a gentle rise to those temperatures. And Mike, when the precipitation comes in on a few of those days or the risk of it, it's going to be a little bit of a messy mix that we'd be seeing. All right. Thanks a lot, Colette. You're welcome. Well, a teenager from Windsor is on a mission to warm the hearts of seniors across her city. I'll tell you how, it includes greeting cards. We'll tell you more about that after the break.
There is a teenager in Windsor who is trying to bring some Christmas cheer to seniors in her city. She loves to make homemade greeting cards and wants to give them out at a local long-term care home. But she needs more, so she put out a call for other crafty people to send her more handmade holiday cards. They're even coming in from overseas. So I started volunteering at a local seniors home about a year ago and I met so many amazing seniors there. Um, some of them, you know, maybe have moved in from outside of Windsor and so don't have a ton of, you know, friends in the area or their friends aren't able to get out and about so they don't receive too many visits. And so I just think it's so important that, especially around the holidays, they get visitors, they get cards, you know, know that they're special and that, you know, they're appreciated. So that's really what the Holiday Happy Mail initiative is all about. And I want to bring this beyond um, the one long-term care home in the area to long-term care homes across Windsor, Essex, uh, and make sure, you know, as many seniors as possible in the area can get a handmade card. Just love the googly-eyed snowman here. It's so cute. So far, um, right here on the table, I think I have um, nearly, I think it's about over 50 cards, but beyond that, the, the bridge in Leamington has made 100. I have um, over 20 schools and community organizations making cards right now. I've actually had some cards sent in all the way from England. Um, they're the sweetest cards right here. It was made by a four-year-old and it just has the sweetest holiday message inside. So I got a package of three of them and I was just so surprised that someone's from so far away um, would take the time to do something so kind for someone, you know, across the ocean. I, you know, I love card making and so um, I like to do a lot of little doodles. For me, that's sort of um, my go-to. But yeah, use your creativity. There's basically no guidelines. I just ask that you leave the envelopes unsealed, um, the cards undated, and that you sign with your first name. What a great initiative and a great PA Day project for any kids staying home tomorrow, like my daughter perhaps. If you want to help out, you can read about her charity, the Stay Gold Society. You can find that story at cbc.ca slash Windsor. We want to leave you now with the unveiling of the Hudson's Bay Christmas window display this morning. Talia Ricci will be here tomorrow night at 11 o'clock. Good night.